Okay, so tonight, where do they stand? An examination of the 2012 presidential candidates and their views on secular government. I, of course, am Derek Miller, and I'm joined here today by our social media chair, Alex Fiorentini. The one thing I hear more than anything else when people, when I try to talk to anybody about religion in the 2012 race, they say, why does it matter? Why does it matter what Romney's religion is? We'll hear it from pundits over and over again. His religion doesn't matter. Leave it out of the equation. Just, just get rid of it. Well, you know what? Religion matters, and it always has. Going back to the election of 1800, when Thomas Jefferson, of all people, was first running for president of the United States, and his election was brutal. The things they said about him based on religion wouldn't fly even today. All the things you can say about atheists today, you couldn't, you couldn't say it. They, I, I've copied a little bit of a, of a pamphlet here. Vote for God and a religious president, John Adams, or impiously declare for Jefferson and no God. As many things as they said about Barack Obama in 2008, voting for him makes you a literally an atheist was not one of them. That was never said. But it was said about Jefferson along with other things about him having affairs with his slaves, which turned out to be true, but <laughs> <laughs> the point of the matter is it was a dirty race, and they said the dirtiest things they could about religion, and that was like the foundations of our country. He was like the third president, not off to a good track record on religion. And you know what? It probably always will. If you look at American attitudes towards religion right now, even though there's this 30% under 30 that are supposedly non-religious, Still, 40% of Americans would not vote for a candidate for president who was atheist, even if they were qualified in virtually every other way, which is preposterous. And, of course, um, there are some polls that say atheists are less trusted than rapists, which isn't specifically political, but should be alarming nonetheless. But why now? Why this election? And the answer is that secular issues are at the forefront of our domestic and foreign policy. Uh, the, there are things that are being said about women and gay people that you wouldn't have expected to have been said in decades, at least. Women's rights, LGBT rights, health care, education, all of those things are, are very important secular issues based on, you know, science and figuring things out, rights of human beings. And then you have other things like the, the Palestinian-Israeli question, where does Jerusalem actually belong, who does God want it to belong to? And the fact that if everyone dies in a nuclear war, do you think that's it? Or do you think you get to go live in happy land forever? These are important questions that I want to know how my leaders feel about them. So if I still haven't made the case for you on why religion should matter in this election and why we should discuss it, uh, let me try again right now. It's already an issue. President Obama's religion has been an issue since 2008 when he was a secret Muslim and then he was an atheist and now he's a Christian, but not really. It kind of, kind of flips, depending on who you talk to. But if President Obama's religion is going to be an issue, it just makes sense that you would look at the religion of the other candidate. Seems to, seems to make sense. And that, that would be only if Romney weren't saying anything about religion. He just let it be. But of course, he is talking about his religion. He talks about it all the time. He refers to, to it frequently on the campaign trail by saying things like, we're all children of the same God in his magic underwear, referring to sky... Skyman Cola from the other planet. Um, and even if that weren't the case, the character of these candidates will influence their decisions. Their religion is a pretty good indicator of how they feel about certain issues and tells something about the moral values and their statements on the subject of religion will speak to that effect. So now we're going to move on to Obama's personal faith. And let's see here. We've got a couple of videos to open. You want to talk about these videos? Uh, yeah, this first one, I believe, if we set it up, yep, is Obama essentially talking about the separation of church and state. People who would say, okay, you know, let's uh, let's put the government or let's uh, put the church into our legal system, for example. And so this is Obama, as it says, mocking the idea that, well, which laws should we put in place? Should we look at, you know? Given the increasing diversity of America's populations, the dangers of sectarianism are greater than ever. Whatever we once were, we are no longer a Christian nation, at least not just. We are also a Jewish nation, a Muslim nation, and a Buddhist nation, and a Hindu nation, and a nation of non-believers. And even if we did have only Christians in our midst, if we expelled every non-Christian 
from the United States of America, whose Christianity would we teach in the schools? Would it be James Dobson's or Al Sharpton's? Which passages of scripture should guide our public policy? Should we go with uh, Leviticus, which uh, suggests slavery is okay, and that eating uh, shellfish is an abomination? Or we could go uh, with uh, Deuteronomy, which suggests stoning your child if he strays from the faith? Or should we just stick to the Sermon on the Mount, a passage that is so radical that it's doubtful that our own Defense Department would survive its application? We. So before we get carried away, let's read our Bibles now. Folks haven't been reading their Bibles. Which brings me to my second point. That democracy demands that the religiously motivated translate their concerns into universal rather than religion-specific values. What do I mean by this? It requires that their proposals be subject to argument and amenable to reason. Now, I may be opposed to abortion for religious reasons, to take one example, but if I seek to pass a law banning the practice, I can't simply point to the teachings of my church or evoke God's will. I have to explain why abortion violates some principle that is accessible to people of all faiths, including those with no faith at all. Now this is, is going to be difficult for some who believe in the inerrancy of the Bible, as many evangelicals do, but in a pluralistic society we have no choice. Politics depends on our ability to persuade each other of common aims based on a common reality. It involves compromise, the art of what's possible. And at some fundamental level, religion doesn't allow for compromise. It's the art of the impossible. If God's spoken, then followers are expected to live up to God's edicts regardless of the consequences. Now, to base one's own life on such uncompromising commitments may be sublime, but to base our policy making on such commitments would be a dangerous thing. And, and if you doubt that, let me just give you an example. We all know the story of Abraham and Isaac. Abraham's ordered by God to offer up his only son. Without argument, he takes Isaac up to the mountaintop, he binds them to the altar, raises his knife, prepares to act as God commanded. Now, we know things worked out. You know, God sends down angel to intercede at the very last minute. Abraham passes God's test of devotion. But it's fair to say that if any of us... Uh, and we'll never know what it's fair to say. <laughs> <laughs> So in that clip, as you can clearly see, Obama is very is going after uh, not just Christianity, but he said religion does not allow for a compromise. So he seems to be on a very uh, attacking religious uh, train of thought, I would say. And that's in contrast with this video where he sort of explains his own religion, his Christianity. Here, Prime Minister Blair shared a story of his awakening to his faith. Perhaps like him, I was not raised in a particularly religious household. I had a father who was born a Muslim but became an atheist, and grandparents who were non-practicing Methodists and Baptists, and a mother who was skeptical of organized religion, even though she was the kindest, most spiritual person I've ever known. She was the one who taught me as a child to love and to understand and to do unto others as I would want done. I didn't become a Christian until many years later when I moved to the south side of Chicago after college. And it happened not because of indoctrination or a sudden revelation, but because I spent month after month working with church folks who simply wanted to help neighbors who were down on their luck, no matter what they looked like or where they came from or who they prayed to. It was on those streets, in those neighborhoods, that I first heard God's Spirit beckon me. It was there that I felt called to a higher purpose, his purpose. The government gives them the drugs, builds bigger prisons, passes a three-strike law, and then wants us to sing God bless America. <laughs> that guy will come up in a second, rest assured. But as you can see in this clip, Obama is really more pro-religion, it seems, and it seems almost kind of a contrast. So 
essentially what I think is going on here, and what seems to be indicated by the quote, is that for Obama, religion, his Christianity, seems to be a, a comfort thing, and more specifically a health thing, where you know, he gets mixed up with the Christian people at the church who are helping people, and Christianity for him almost seems to be a name-only thing, where his goal is to help people, and to be a good person, to understand that everyone is a child of God, and we have a responsibility to them. And it almost seems that he sort of slaps Christianity over it to, I don't know, flavor it better, I would almost say. And otherwise, the quote sort of just says that he feels comfortable with God, and it gives him a source of comfort in what he does. Let's see, and the pastor you saw was Jeremiah Wright, who, at the time that Obama attended the Trinity United Church of Christ, the pastor was there, and he said a bunch of controversial things, including the U.S. of KKKA, and things about, there it is, it's the quote about how we bombed Hiroshima, we bombed Nagasaki, and then he says that's the reason why we were attacked at 9-11, because our foreign policy is coming back to bite us in the ass. So, of course, Obama, having gone to that church at the time, got into a lot of trouble politically, which is, you know, do you follow this preacher? Like, what the heck is up with that? And so he had to go on and have a statement that says, look, I condemn this guy, I don't agree with him, and I'm sure you, talking to his audience, not you guys, uh, disagree with your pastors on a lot of issues. And so that was that whole fiasco with Obama, and is he a crazy religious person like his pastor was? We, of course, all disagree with our pastors. <laughs> uh, looking to Mitt Romney, you'll find that a lot of the intellectual nuance uh, that we saw in Barack Obama is simply not present. Um, first, we're going to uh, watch a little segment here where more, uh, Romney talks a little. It's a CNN segment, so Romney talks a little bit, and, uh, and there's also a narrator and a guy talking, I think, a Mormon guy. Our Father in Heaven. For Mitt Romney, it's a divine question that won't go away. What would it mean to have a devout Mormon in the White House? We're thankful on the occasion of the birth of thy son. The question won't go away largely because many voters don't understand what it means to be Mormon. Some voters believe the Mormon church still allows a man to have multiple wives. This was Romney in 60 Minutes. I can't imagine anything more awful than polygamy. And some view Mormons with suspicion, wondering if powerful church leaders could somehow control a Mormon president. Hi, Gary. How are you? Like caught up with Mitt Romney in Michigan. I think Americans want a person of faith to lead the country. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, they care about the particular brand of faith so much as whether we share values. Here in Salt Lake City at the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Romney's candidacy has put church leaders under a microscope. Now is the time for all of us to reach out and tell others who we are. In a rare interview, Apostle Russell Ballard, a top Mormon leader, is crystal clear. There is no relationship between the campaign and the church. Does the church endorse candidates for president of the United States? No, we don't. Do you think it's proper for a politician to spread the word about their religion the same way they did when they were on their missions? No, I think that uh, would be terribly misunderstood. The suspicion that as president, Romney might take orders from the church derives from Mormon history. Church presidents are considered prophets. In 1843, a prophet's divine revelation led to polygamy. It was then abolished in 1890. So what if today's church president had a major revelation? Could that influence a Romney White House? Is it up to all faithful Mormons to follow the tenets of the revelation? If it is a declaration for the entire church, the answer to that is yes. And is that infrequent, though, in the in modern infrequent. times? It's infrequent today because... The foundation of the church is solidly in place. There is certainly prejudice against Mormons. Hello, sir. How are you? I'm one person who will not vote for a Mormon. Oh, is that right? Not Can I shake your hand anyway? No. Okay. <laughs> the Southern Baptist Convention calls the church a cult. Many Americans say they don't even consider Mormons Christians. An article in the online magazine Slate brands the religion's founder, Joseph Smith, a con man. In fact, he was Elder Russell Ballard's great-great-uncle. What does Joseph Smith mean to a faithful Mormon? Everything. God, the Eternal Father, and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, appeared to him. Mormons believe in the Old and New Testaments, but also in the Book of Mormon. Think of it as kind of a sequel to the Bible. We believe that the Garden of Eden was uh, on this continent. 
So that the Garden of Eden wasn't in the Holy Land? No, not in our doctrine. For Mormons, Eden was in Missouri, and Jesus Christ visited the Americas after the resurrection. We know that he came and taught the, the people and restored the gospel to them. Has Jesus returned here to the United States in your beliefs? Oh, yes. So are you considering communicating more about your religion to the American public? You know, I'm happy to talk about my faith uh, to people in our, in our country. I believe in God. Uh, I believe that uh, all the children on earth are, are children of God. So will there be a speech about this at some point? Perhaps. I haven't given that a, a final uh, uh, decision at this point. A looming political question for a man of faith who's not overly eager to publicly talk about his Mormon faith. Gary Tuckman, CNN, Dearborn, Michigan. Well, in fact, Mitt Romney did make up his mind. The 2007 election cycle gave a speech, or the 2008 election cycle, I'm sorry, it was in 2007, he gave this speech, and he talked exactly about what his religion, uh, in, in what ways his religion would impact his presidency. And here's part of what he said, that people who do not feel that religion has played an important part in American history are basically going against the Founding Fathers, who, of course, discovered the essential connection between the survival of the free land and the protection of religious freedom. Our Constitution was made for moral and religious people, he said, and without it, it couldn't possibly stand. Freedom requires religion as much as religion requires freedom, according to Romney, and this opens up the windows of the soul so that man can so on and so forth. Um, but basically, you see here, None of the intellectual nuance, none of the, this is where my faith is, and this is where it ends, and this is what it inspires me to do. For him, it's pretty much the be-all, end-all. I wish I could make this so that my desktop went away. Uh, oh, hey, there we go. Okay, so what we're going to do next, now that we know a little bit about the candidates' personal lives, is we're going to take a look at them issue by issue and see where they've come down on what we, what we picked as a few secular issues. Now, there are dozens of secular issues that might matter to you varying on you know what your priorities are at any given time. We've picked a few simple ones here in the interest of time and the Secular Coalition for America actually has a score sheet. I'll we'll talk about that in a little bit, but they break things down very specifically. We can even send that out in the next email if enough of you are interested uh, in receiving that. So anyway, we're going to go down topic by topic right now, candidate by candidate, starting well, this is all in alphabetical that order, of course. We're going to start with abortion. So Obama's stance on abortion, he supports Roe v. Wade, uh, and he supports women's right to have an abortion, but either because of his, well, personal leanings or for political strategy, he's also strongly emphasized that he is in favor of limiting late-term abortions. He's also in favor of adoption and, of course, reducing the actual number of abortions. And let's see. It's interesting to note with Obamacare and the whole pre-existing thing, pre-existing conditions thing, that abortions are not a pre-existing condition. In other words, under Obamacare, you can go get insurance. Even if you have a pre-existing condition, the insurance company still has to take you, unless you're pregnant. But then there's another exception that says if you're pregnant because of rape, incest, or it's threatening your life, then it counts as a pre-existing condition. So it's kind of nuanced, but... Seems, seems relatively in line with the rest of Obama's to ends on his separation of religion and state and so on. As for Romney, although he once supported the right of... Yes? The second part, the abortions are not covered as pre-existing conditions. Now, was that something Obama put forward, or is that how it came out of Congress? It came out of Congress. So, to say that's his opinion. Dubious. Yeah. But, anyway, you, you get the idea of what he's going for. Um... Okay, so although Romney once supported the right of women to, to have uh, legal and safe abortions, he now says he would repeal Roe v. Wade. It's one of those day one things he says he'd do. On his website, it says Mitt Romney is pro-life. He believes it speaks well of the country that almost all Americans recognize abortion is a problem. Almost all. Okay. Uh, and in the quiet of conscience, believe people of both political parties know that more a million abortions a year cannot be squared with the good heart of America. Strong words, and words that he probably believes quite deeply. Moving on to another issue of women's rights, this time contraception. So as you guys may remember, there was the fiasco with insurance companies, or not insurance companies, uh, religious employers having to cover contraception for women. And of course, some religious employers, Catholic employers, 
would say, no, we don't want to give these women contraception. That's against our beliefs. And due to the religious backlash, Obama made a compromise with his plan and says, okay, look, you religious employers, you Catholic hospitals and so on, don't need to cover contraception for the women who work for you. But insurance companies who insure women who work for these employers will have to cover contraception. And that is in line with this quote that basically says, look, I don't care how old you are, where you work, how much money you make, you should have access to contraception. Uh, Romney, as of Tuesday, this Tuesday, two days ago, uh, now supports the right of women to obtain and use contraceptives. He said at the debate when pressed on it by Obama, uh, I just know that I don't think bureaucrats in Washington should tell someone whether or not they can use contraceptives, and I don't believe employers should tell someone whether they can have contraceptive care or not. Every woman in America should have access to contraceptives. So that's as of Tuesday. <laughs> What's uh, there? Wednesday. What was his stance prior to Tuesday? Well, in the uh, in the Republican nomination, in the course of the of the nomination of the primaries, he would often talk about well, especially when the the Obama contraception issue really came to light in February, he would talk a lot about the importance of religious freedom, which was kind of his code word for I would probably restrict contraception. Moving on to creationism, where we have a breath of fresh air. So, you'll see in a minute, there actually isn't much of a difference between these candidates. And Obama says he believes in evolution. He thinks that science and faith are different things. You don't put faith in a science classroom, and so on. So it's a pretty, pretty mild stance on that. I don't think there's anything really to disagree with from a secular perspective on that. It's about the same with Romney. When he was governor of Massachusetts, he opposed intelligent design. And creationism says, in my opinion, science classes were to teach of evolution. If there are other scientific thoughts to be discussed, um, you know, if we want to talk about philosophy, we can do it in social studies or or something like that. I think it's fine. It looks all right to me. Um, I'm pretty confident that he would probably stand by that as president. So freedom of speech, we we frame specifically since you could take this issue in countless different directions. We frame it specifically in the context of blasphemy, and even more specifically uh, in the context of what's happened in the last month with reaction to that Nation of Islam video on YouTube and the resulting protests, and how both campaigns have reacted. So this quote by Obama makes his stance a little, I won't say nuanced, it's very interesting. On the one hand, he says that we do not and should not ban blasphemy, the response to uh, hateful speech is, well, more speech it, coming from both sides, but it's interesting because he throws in blasphemy, he sort of ties it to bigotry, and it does depend on how you do it, but at the same time it's a little worrying that uh, he's got almost sort of a double stance on it where he says, yeah, blasphemy is totally fine, but he's also lumping it in with bigotry and talking about hate speech, so it's a little, little concerning on that respect in terms of how much he would protect blasphemy. Not all that buddy-buddy on blasphemy for what you would have heard from that first video we saw of him. A um, little blasphemy of his own there. Uh, Romney, if, if you didn't hear about this, this was the night on September 11th when we heard that four people had died in our consulate in Libya and we weren't sure what happened. He actually came out that same night and said this. The embassy of the United States issued what appeared to be an apology for American principles. It's a terrible course for America to stand in and apologize for our values, and apology for America's values is never the right course. The obvious theme here is apology, apology, apology. That's uh, a, a consistent conservative criticism of the Obama White House, that he's apologizing for America. But nonetheless, you see here within his message that American principles, and, and we're assuming he's referring to free speech here, because it's in reaction to the video, shouldn't be apologized for. So blasphemy, apparently, in Mitt Romney's view, thumbs up. So LGBT rights, you guys may remember that Obama came out in support of same-sex marriage following his Vice President Joe Biden, and uh, just sort of along the lines of his, what I would call nominal, in-name-only Christianity, he justifies it or coats it in a talk about Jesus, the golden rule, treat others how you want to be treated, and of course that has legal implications with uh, equal protection. So currently his stance is that same-sex couples should allow, be allowed to get married. Romney, on the other hand, I, I laughed the other day when I heard him say this in a video. He says, 
that discrimination against all people, all gay people, is, is bad and he shouldn't do it, but he doesn't want them to get married. Um, so that's, that's actually his stance. He says he agrees with 3,000 years of recorded history. Marriage is a sacred institution between a man and a woman. It's first and foremost about nurturing and developing children. He's also said, and he said it again Tuesday night uh, at that debate, he said that every child deserves both a mother and a father, which is insulting not only to single mothers and single fathers, but also every homosexual person. And he says it's unfortunate that those who choose to defend the institution of marriage are often demonized. I guess that'd be me to demonize me. Um, so that's Romney's stance on LGBT rights. He's been consistent about that one um, well since the 90s. Okay, can't expect him to be consistent all the time. So Obama did, a uh, while ago, lead the charge to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And he says that it will strengthen our national security. It'll make it a lot easier for those soldiers to serve because they won't have to worry, oh God, am I going to get found out? You know, as if they're infiltrating the enemy or something. And also, a little sort of less talked about issue that Obama weighed in on was the issue of chaplains, military chaplains, performing same-sex marriages in the military because a lot of them would say, no, I don't want to do that. And Obama and the Obama administration came out saying, no, if you're going to be a military chaplain, you have to do your duty. And he said that would help the army or help the armed forces with their unity and basically you know, that's your job. So that was his stance on that issue. Okay, I missed that. So in a foreign country, you can get a same-sex marriage from a military chaplain? Yeah. Pretty sure. Huh. I, I'd have to double check on what the specifics of, of mil military chaplaincies are. I can't imagine a lot of people are getting married while they're deployed. Um, I'll, I'll look into it a little more. Yeah, we should. Uh, Romney, on the other hand, although he probably wouldn't have made the push, almost certainly wouldn't have made the push to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell in the first place, says he wouldn't reverse it now. Uh, he wasn't comfortable making the change when we were, you know, at two simultaneous wars, but now that things are drawing down, it seems like it's fine, and that problem is no longer an issue. So we wouldn't have to worry about that, at least. Our fighting men and women can remain on equal terms. So, sex education. Of course, there's the continual battle between abstinence-only education and comprehensive sex education, which of course teaches contraception and a bunch of other stuff surrounding the issue of, well, don't have sex. Uh, Obama has set aside a relatively large amount of money in his budget for what he referred to as evidence-based sex education, which is to say he's, gonna, he's willing to look at the different curriculums and say, okay, which ones actually succeed? in keeping teens from getting pregnant and getting abortions and all that stuff. So, and of course, uh, abstinence only usually does not work, so it seems that he would be in favor of comprehensive sex education following that evidence-based policy. However, it is worth noting that in Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, there is a provision to provide $50 million per year over the course of five years towards abstinence only programs. Now, it's hard to say whether or not Obama tried to fight this or just let it consciously slip by. I really was not able to find so much on that. And Obama's good about keeping quiet about stuff that doesn't make him look progressive. So that's just something to consider. Uh, Romney, on the other hand, when he was governor of Massachusetts, implemented abstinence-only sex education programs for 12 to 14-year-olds, which, of course, we know are the horniest children alive. So I can't imagine <laughs> that was a very well-thought-out choice. He says he fought for abstinence education in the toughest of states, made the toughest of decisions, and it was right for America, and he has conservative values. So that's Romney on sex education. So how does this end up? Well, here's, here are the final grades from the Secular Coalition of America. Uh, you'll notice Barack Obama has a C, Mitt Romney has an F. Uh, our third party candidates I'll get to in a minute. Now, our, by our presentation, you would probably just think, well, why don't you guys love Obama? He was good on almost everything that you said he was good by those standards. Well, the fact of the matter is the Secular Coalition of America has a far more detailed criteria. They not only look at things that are secular issues, but also things that aren't really considered in conventional politics. Things like, do you attend national prayer breakfasts? You know, we saw Obama at the national prayer breakfast. He obviously does that. Do you support government-sponsored national days of prayer? Do you support having in God we trust on the currency? All sorts of things that bug us, but really only us and in such a way that they aren't discussed and barely anyone 
actually puts an opinion forth on it. And considering how well Obama plays into that part of mainstream politics, the best he can do is a C, even if he's good on almost all of our other issues. He's by no means someone who has a secular agenda for America at the, at, in mind, really, at the forefront of his policy proposals. Mitt Romney, on the other hand, not only buys into all those conventions, but goes even further. Uh, unknown exactly how he would govern, because he manages to flip and flop on so many issues. Very easy to take things he said during primary elections and try to apply them to how he is in the general election. If you've been watching the debates, you see that that doesn't always work, and his positions magically shift when he wants them to. It really depends on how he would work with Congress. But as of right now, it doesn't look like he would be all that great in terms of being a secular president. So what if, what if that's it, and secularism is your number one cause? Well, you may want to look into libertarian candidate Gary Johnson, who, in his stance of let government out of everything, also opposes almost all forms of theocracy. Since he actually was governor of New Mexico, he has a governing record of supporting many very good programs that we would actually like to see the federal government implement. Uh, and that's something to consider and look more into. Like I said, if you want me to send out uh, the official scorecard from the Secular Coalition of America, I can do that. Uh, you can have it in your next email and check it out before Election Day. Uh, Jill Stein is awesome. She's very good. She had an A in almost everything she was able to answer. But the problem is, since she's never had the responsibility of governing, not all of these questions apply to her. And since she answered fewer than half of the questions that were on their little scorecard, she was ineligible for a funding rate. Uh, so all of these things, important to look into. I doubt most of you vote on secularism as your number one issue. I think you'd probably be concerned about getting a job after college, maybe lowering those tuition rates. Uh, that's personally what I vote on the basis of, but this is just a little bit of what you may want to know when you head into the election booth, either early voting at the union starting October 22nd, or, of course, on election day. So thanks, everybody, and if you have questions, we'll answer them. Yes, Max? So tell me, as a non-stupid voter, would it truly be in my best interest to vote for a third party candidate? See, this is where it's going to get complicated, and the political science in me, the scientist in me is going to start drawing curves on the board. All right, that's why I didn't ask that question. Okay. Um, <laughs> in Illinois, the thing is, okay, you live in Illinois. It's given that Barack Obama wins the state of Illinois. If you want to send a message to the Democratic Party in Illinois, voting for a third party may be a good way to do that. The problem is you can't write on your vote, I didn't vote for you because you opposed indefinite detention and took it out of your party platform, which is what I'd like to write, and then I'd like to check the box for Jill Stein. Um, but... Uh, that, that is a way you can send a message, and actually you'll notice like the Tea Party in 2010, the way that people started voting for unconventional or non-traditional Republican candidates actually changed the rhetoric of the entire Republican Party. So the way that you vote actually does matter in the way that the mainstream uh, parties couch their issues and, and kind of propose them to you. We can talk more about this at Merkins because I love third parties. Any other questions? Yeah, I'll just comment that there was an interesting development today on the Mormonism front. Uh, for ever since the beginning of Mormonism, it's been the Protestant view that they are a dangerous cult. And to very, today, Billy Graham himself removed Mormonism from the list of cults on his website. I didn't know so that. So now there's wow. this unholy matrimony. The dark forces. Uh, <laughs> the new Iron Triangle. New Iron Triangle. <laughs> Can I just say that Billy Graham has lost some of his standing within the Baptist uh, community um, in his old age. Oh, has uh, he? Yeah, he's he's gotten a little more liberal, and they've been noticing. They don't like it, so they kind of see him as the old man who's going a little off the deep end. That's interesting. I didn't know the current Mormon prophet is um, suspected of having Alzheimer's set in. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. So we may see some revelations. We may, <laughs> yeah. Which may very well. They're keeping him. They're, they've been hiding him. He came, what? Yeah, he came out for general conference and, didn't, and normally he speaks, but he just had this little thing, and it's just kind of this, ooh. 
But there was a huge development in the Mormon Church. They lowered the missionary age to 18. It used to be 19 for boys. And from 21 to 19 for girls, because they, they feel that they need to expedite spreading God's message. Because the end times are coming. Oh! Yeah, awesome. That's good. To, I thought they came, like, last year in May. And I missed it. I totally missed it. Um, but that's good to know. That's interesting. I didn't know there were... There were those new developments in the Mormon Church. Every six months. Any other questions, comments? No? Okay. Well.